So we we did want to have a hard stop at 10 so that we could get back together just for some um, comments and, and moving forward. Um, and there's obviously more than we could possibly cover here, but it's exciting to have Julia speak and and um, be able to start some of this discussion. Um, could you go to the next slide? Yeah, so just wait. We might just wait for a minute more just to make sure everybody's in. Um, and if you want to, um, I, really, we want to be able to have this as an open discussion, have your video on and have a conversation. Um, but feel free to, to introduce yourself in the chat um, for those that, that don't know each other. And um, throughout, we'll try to have um, questions in the chat that we can get to, but raise your hand uh, so that we can actually have some direct conversation um, during question time and discussion. Um, we'll also try to focus on the driving questions and associated uncertainties um, and, and save for later workshop really, uh, you know, the how of why, how we might address this with modeling. But everybody's really welcome to brainstorm, put whatever ideas towards that in the chat that you hear as we're going through, um, through the questions and, and, and some of the potential hypotheses here. Um, and also another thing it would be great is just who, who else is here? I know you guys are all the important people that should be here for this discussion, but who else is missing? So let's make sure we get that down in the chat while we're going as well. Um, I think how many participants we got? 25. Um, let's just wait one more minute. I think on the sign up sheet, I saw there's going to be 30 to 40. So, <laughs> yeah, I think though that that was um, those that we actually got quite a good turnout compared to those that registered early. So I think we'll just go forward in just a minute. But um, um, so here we go. Uh, okay, so why don't we just start now so that we don't run out of time. Um, so I'm most pleased to have Julia Voss uh, presenting here. Um, she is a field scientist who's recently joined King County after many years of similar engagement in ecology and has a, a broad collaboration. The more I read, the more I find who she's collaborated with. Um, and I was um, really interested in the science paper that you recently had with UW folks. And I'd, I'd ask us folks to have a look at that as well as a recommendation. Um, What's important for this discussion is that she is co-leading the currently funded effort that's addressing monitoring gaps through the Puget Sound Partnership, uh, the PSAMP uh, program it's called. And these modeling efforts are being leveraged here. And the idea is to leverage and look at what, what we can address in terms of uh, combined modeling and monitoring and what are the low hanging fruit? What are the things we can do now? Um, and so with that, I will hand over and um, see you at the other side of this. Thank you, Stefano. So next slide, please. Thank you. So I wanna start with just um, my goal today as giving a teaser talk is to help frame the conversation. Today's conversation is brief, but uh, this will carry on into future workshops. So um, this uh, illustration, I think, gets at what we wanna talk about today. Um, this shows the California current uh, marine ecosystem, but it also is related to the Salish Sea ecosystem, right? So we, we do want to talk about phytoplankton and the role that phytoplankton plays in primary production and how then in turn that um, impacts the rest of the food web and uh, how it drives the base of our cold water food web, which ultimately includes our iconic species such as orca and salmon. Um, we have uh, seen lots of talks given by ecology colleagues who have um, and conduct the long-term monitoring program that's sound wide. Uh, they couldn't participate today, so I just wanna to refer to their work. Um, the long-term ambient program, uh, through that data, Christopher Crims has reported a lot of changes in observed variables such as nutrients and um, 
you know, we just want to state that, you know, that's a bellwether program. It can show changes, but it doesn't really discuss why and how these changes are happening. There are hypotheses out there, and that's what today's discussion is going to address. And so uh, primarily phytoplankton and um, its production and composition and how phytoplankton's role is um, involved in nutrient cycling, such as nitrogen and carbon cycling. All right, next slide, please. Before I get to that, I wanted to refer to the historical work and the current work that Stefano was talking about. Um, regional scientists have gotten together through PSIMP to talk about monitoring gaps. The Puget Sound Partnership asked PSIMP to uh, inform them about monitoring gaps and information gaps that are really critical to understand in Puget Sound. So one of the um, things we identified through that work led by Stephanie Moore and Kim Stark was that there's a huge gap in the spatial and temporal resolution of phytoplankton species in abundance, which I will refer to as composition. And another big gaps are in rates such as production, respiration, and sinking. So these are um, framing the conversation for today um, about what do we know, what do we need to know, what are unknowns, and how do we begin to address these through modeling. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, related to this today, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the observations just conceptually that Christopher has reported through his analysis at Ecology. So uh, seeing changes, long-term changes observed, for instance, changes in uh, nutrient balance. So silicate to nitrogen ratios are declining as well as the near bottom to surface chlorophyll amounts. Uh, he is seeing and reporting seasonal changes in stratification and chlorophyll A, and I will just share that my colleagues at King County also see changes in stratification. And also there are seasonal changes and shifts in variables such as dissolved oxygen, nitrogen, salinity, and temperature. And so for today's discussion and future discussions, we want to talk about the impacts of these changes, why these matter to our food web, and and especially nutrient cycling, so we can begin to understand, um, you might say, the metabolism of Puget Sound and if it's changing, whether it's heterotrophic or autotrophic at times. And then to talk about hypotheses around these changes and how we can begin to test these and the questions we need to ask to test these hypotheses in these discussions that we're having today and in the future. One of the things I did mention stratification, and I just want to share that those physical and hydrodynamic processes are being discussed in another breakout group today. So we won't discuss those today. All right, next slide, please. Before we get into discussions, just a, a little bit of uh, business here framing. Um, as Stefano mentioned, there is an effort going on um, with another series of workshops around monitoring uh, uh, for primary production and phytoplankton. Uh, we were awarded a grant through the Peace Center Marine Waters Work Group to begin developing indicators and determining what information we have and need for developing indicators. So this is not redundant or duplicative of today's workshops and the series of workshops. These are about questions and uncertainties that modeling can help answer. So these are complementary workshops and I'm so happy that both are happening. Okay, next slide, please. And one more framing, we want to all have a common language and make sure we have a shared knowledge. And so um, in the PSIMP workshop that we just held, we talked about the importance of terms and definitions. And two terms I want to bring up today so that we're all on the same page are biomass and primary production. Gabrielle Hanek led us through this very, very well and effectively. So these are two different terms. When we talk about biomass, we're talking about either a content or concentrations. A lot, of, a lot of people measure chlorophyll A in this region and they use that as a proxy for biomass. It is very difficult to translate that into carbon content. There's a lot of assumptions that have to be made. So when we talk about biomass, it's very different than what we mean by primary production. Primary production is a rate, it is, you know, uh, carbon assimilation, it is the uptake of inorganic constituents and turning those into organic matter. And that is a rate. So let's be clear and, um, you know, mindful when we use these terminology. Okay, next slide, please. 
Okay, jumping back into today's goals. So we wanna begin our discussion around phytoplankton's role and function in the Salish Sea food web. And I can't see the acknowledgement at the bottom, but this is um, a, a conceptual model by the Long Live the King's work with um, some of the Canadian scientists. And I've uh, highlighted here the phytoplankton component of the Salish Sea food web to illustrate that when we talk in this group, we're talking about phytoplankton production and um, phytoplankton's role in nutrient cycling in the euphotic zone. We are not talking about macrophytes such as seagrasses or seaweeds or detritus. And then next slide, please. Okay, I wanna talk, get us into conversation. So I'm gonna talk about some of the observed changes and maybe um, the hypotheses that are driving these changes. So. One of the ideas is that with a shift in nutrient balance, for instance, the decline of silicate to nitrogen, we could be seeing a shift from a diatom-based food web to a microbial-based food web. And certain microbes are able to leverage um, different types of uh, nutrient balances more easily than the diatom-based food web. And so we wanna understand if that's happening and the importance of that change. Um, we don't know why that change is happening, but that's part of our discussions to begin to explore these hypotheses. Um, so changing food web composition and nutrient balance is one of the um, things to discuss. Next slide, please. And then as Christopher and um, the team at Ecology have shown, there are these large scale blooms of Noctiluca that can occur um, variably throughout the sound and in different years. And I just wanted to show that as um, an illustration of a hypothesis that with these type of um, organisms and blooms, what can happen, and this is observed with the Victoria Clipper monitoring that was led by Brandon Suckman, these blooms can clear out the entire water column of chlorophyll. And so one of the hypotheses is that then the organic matter is kept in the surface layer. And this results in, um, I like this term, squishy versus crunchy. It re results in the more uh, gelatinous type of food web, which keeps nutrients and organic matter in the surface. It's a lower quality food. It can affect the upper trophic levels of the food web. And also when the organic matter is recycled through the squishy food web, if you will, that means there's less heavier matter falling out to the benthos. And so benthic communities could be affected. Ecology sediment team uh, led by um, analysis done by Sandy Weekland has shown that the benthic communities could be in decline and a hypothesis is that there's less organic matter making it to certain parts of the basins and regions that could be affecting those communities. So that's another hypothesis to discuss today. Okay, next slide please. And rolling it all up, uh, Christopher has given us permission to show this conceptual model that um, illustrates these hypotheses and the potential impacts to the food web. And um, I think with that, this starts off our conversation and I'm gonna hand it back to Stefano for discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you could just go to the next slide. Yeah, so why don't we just start with some question and answers, um, some question time uh, regarding this, and then uh, depending on how it goes, we've got, got some specifics that it would be really good to get some feedback on um, in terms of next steps and uh, opportunities that uh, have been identified from discussions already. And I think I have to unmute you, so please raise your hand. Mike, just one second. I think I have to ask you to unmute. Okay, see how that goes. Yeah, <clears throat> my question is, um, can you hear me? Good, thank right. you. My so I put it in my uh, put it in the chat chat box as well. Is do we have a good understanding of how well the models that are being used in Puget Sound actually represent the phytoplankton dynamics? Do they represent? you know, the major groups and their seasonality, um, their spatial distribution, how well is that, how well is that resolved? 
Yeah, and I'm just having a look if there's anyone else in the room that can speak to that. Um, but I'll start and people can just jump in there. Um, so this is really a good discussion to have with some of the, with, with Parker specifically and Terang for the, for the two models that, that represent some of this. Um, it's only recently that the Salish Sea model in the most recent versions even includes uh, some, some phytoplankton um, cycling of nutrients. Um, and the questions that I'm seeing when we get to the, the monitoring component is that we're not even really understanding even that level um, in terms of what's changing. So I think there are specifics uh, that can be addressed within this. Um, but at, at present, it's really at a nascent stage. It really is at a nascent stage. Uh, I think, Stephanie, are you on? I can see you're on this. I wonder if you had anything further uh, to add from that, from that side. Hold on one second. Are you calling on me here? Yeah. Well, you're nice just coming back from out the region, so it's nice to see your face. Yeah, <laughs> good deal. So, yeah, sorry, I was multitasking here. Um, but yes, the it's, I think, a great question. And um, it is a, it's a challenge that also we have a similar challenge because now I'm in the I'm in the Southern California bite region now, just kind of keeping listening in. It's good to see everybody and hear about what's going, what's new. But as uh, Martha's presentation this morning, yeah, the phytoplankton groups are not um, quite well represented in the models yet. And um, I think one of the challenges is that uh, there, of course, phytoplankton communities are very variable and uh, it's hard to model these. And another, I think, challenge from, I, from a modeling perspective that I've noticed is that a lot of these uh, rates in the models and um, they, all, they tend to be fixed for the different groups. Um, there's a temperature dependency, um, but what we notice in, in natural en environments is that productivity can really change quite a bit throughout the year and has a seasonality to it. So yeah, it's certainly a, a challenge and I think uh, it's not quite there yet. I'll be interested to hear about um, if there are nested models that are happening. I, I remember at one point back when I was up in um, the Puget Sound region is that there was um, there were folks working considering about nesting um, high, higher level models with the Salish Sea model but to look at the ecosystem. Other ecosystems, as Julia mentioned in the beginning, so I'm not sure what the status of that is now, but that would be interesting to see where that, that goes as well. Thanks, Stephanie. Actually, that's a really good point to touch on also. One of the other breakout groups is being led um, by Bob McCain from EPA, um, and they're specifically talking about the watershed model, but it's it's the coupling of the watershed model, Belmo, um, the Salish Sea model, and then Atlantis, which gets up to higher trophic level uh, engagement. And, and just to be clear, Jan's put in the chat here that um, Live Ocean uh, does have a phytoplankton component, and, and so does the Salish Sea model um, in the most recent version. But in the discussions we've most recently had, the rates uh, and the, the challenge of the biomass and so forth are are, there's still a lot of work and opportunity there. Um, and so I'm going to go in order of hands up. So um, uh, Kimberly, if you would go next. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to, I'm going to lower my hand, why not? Um, respond to Mike's question. Um, and particularly for Quartermaster Harbor, this is an area we have um, a lot of data for the water and phytoplankton. Um, I don't think the model does particularly well here because I think in these, these really shallow embayments, um, particularly in the near shore area where there's a lot of mass cells where the model uh, doesn't perform as well. Um, it's just really hard because the phytoplankton dynamics are just kind of crazy in these kind of really shallow embayments that it's extremely difficult for for the model or any model to, to really capture not only like the groups and the temporal aspects of how 
um, phytoplankton can change so rapidly. And then that affects when it's modeling for the dissolved oxygen. I think it's extremely difficult to get it right in, in these embayments. And another thing, as long as I don't have to raise my hand again, is I think a real gap we're missing, and, and other people might be able to chime in with the answer. Um, maybe uh, Ron is, I don't, we're not really looking at benthic diatoms, particularly in some of these near shore and shallow areas, and what the effect of they're having on the uh, reflux there and the, the geo, biogeochemical cycling there. And this is just anecdotally, but they've seen, especially in the last few years where we've had these warming waters, we've had these low tides come inside with warm temperatures. Um, there's been a real increase in benthic diatoms. And so I think um, this is a gap. I don't know if it's, it's how large the impact is, um, but I, I would be very interested in hearing from folks who know more about that, um, if that's something a piece we're missing. Thanks, Kimberly. Uh, so Kyung, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, hi, um, I just have a note about the question, how model are from the Michael Brass question, how models are available to predict the plankton and Celesi model does have that part with the recent version. We do have Ditem and Dino flag. Yes, flagellate. <laughs> Thank you. Um, which is the major um, phytoplankton, as we know. So that part is there. And then the recent paper, and we have comparison plot um, between Julia's data set with the model output. And you can see that plot from the recent paper of blog paper. But on top of it, I, I also have curiosities because we only do have to species, but then we also know that there are other major species that we need to care about. For example, in case of the hood canard, the name of the plankton. that one, I, I heard, I read it from um, on paper and it says that even though in hood canard, even though there's a low nutrient, those Rg blooms can happen. And it's, I it seems like that, that region that having an ice bloom is something that they were expecting rather than not expecting. So like there are a lot of like complexity on this salicy part that we need to understand better and we want to include in our model. So there, I, I, I would like to say there, there's a lot of work that we need to do, but seasonality, we could see that from the previous paper. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and Jan, let me yeah hand over to you, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, the coccolithophore blooms in Hood Canal, they're, they're fascinating. Um, and they do seem to be more prevalent in years when we have marine heat waves. So there's there's some interesting things there. Um, yeah, I, I really want to put a, a plug in for something that was touched on during Martha's talk and in the question that, you know, Parker raised, you know, like, where does the funding come for this? Because as I think about Puget Sound and the data sets that we have and the modeling capabilities that we have. It's incredibly rich, but on the other hand, what isn't so rich is the, um, um, well, there's three bins. <laughs> One is um, the focus on the models. And, you know, thank you, Su Kyung, for your, um, for your comment there. I remember back in the day when Mitsuhiro Kawasi and Bruce Nairn were leading the ABC group, Aquatic Biogeochemical Cycling Model. We had this really great, um, it was more conceptual model, but I think it did get coded at one time. And there was a lot of energy by biologists and chemists into this. And, and it would be nice to, as a community, be thinking about, you know, this whole question about phytoplankton and how they remineralize things differently, um, the different groups. Um, so that's one lump of studies I think really needs to happen. The other is exploiting the data sets, you know, so everybody has data sets, but we struggle to get the analysis. Um, Kim was mentioning the 
you know, abundance of benthic diatoms, you know, that there's, there's a lot of hypotheses that we could be exploring, not just within one data set, but across data sets. And a lot of this is coming out through the phytoplankton group that, that Julia is co-leading. Um, and I'll have to say, I have um, primary productivity rate data from the 90s and 2000s collected under PRISM, but this Again, you know, you don't have the funds and time to dedicate a student or a grad student or a technician or yourself to, to make these analyses. And then the third lump, so developing the models better, exploiting our data better um, with question-driven um, hypotheses. The third is the model data comparison, and that really gets to the heart of um, a lot of what we've heard this morning also. And to me, that's where the rubber meets the road. We're never going to have confidence in the models if we don't do this step really well and openly. And, and you know, we heard from Kim how in uh, um, Vashon area, you know, it doesn't work that way. Well, but we need to know those things. Maybe it works really well in other places and we just need to be aware of those differences. And so, so um, I guess I'm a little bit on my soapbox, but as somebody who's been doing Puget Sound research for a long time, I've always been mystified that there isn't a better way to harness resources for local investigations with the data sets that, and capabilities that we have. So that's what I'm calling for. Um, thank you. Thank you, um, Jan. And I think there's one I'll take from the chat since there's no more hands up here. I think uh, Mike Connor had um, mentioned something. Mike, are you able to get on, on or should I read it out? Where are you? Yeah, I can, I can uh, get on. Well, there are just a number of really interesting questions that um, I think I agree. Having worked with Jan over the years, I agree with everything. Um, she's mentioned. I think the one big interesting question is there's still a debate in the Chesapeake between NOAA and EPA over whether or not things are driven by uh, grazing versus uh, nutrient loads. And certainly both have an impact. And it would really, modeling to a large extent is storytelling. And we have, rather than coming up with specific three, three uh, uh, significant figure answers, we, 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 we really want to tell stories to help us understand how the sound works. And this whole question of where is it light limited, how often, where's it nutrient limited, how often, where's it grazing limited, how often, that has a huge impact on the kinds of change management choices you have. And it would really be nice to start to express the data we do have into those limiting factors. So understanding that, understanding the total carbon budget, understanding this other question of shallow, the model throws shallow out uh, because it doesn't do well in shallow. It, it, it says, oh, well, we can't really predict that. But it's a really interesting question. To what extent in a lot of estuaries, shallow water processes then drive offshore processes? And that would be a really important thing to understand to what extent is that happening here again, it gets to this sort of question of light penetration. Are there do you or is it shallow enough? You're able to create a lot of productivity as a result. You're exporting to deeper waters or not? And the other the other thing I'm totally puzzled by is leaving out micro macro algae and uh, versus just doing phytoplankton. That that seems to short shrift. Well, Puget Sound is much deeper than most estuaries. But there's still a heck of a lot of production from uh, seaweeds, kelps, and, and seagrasses. And you got to work those into the process. And I'll get off my soapbox. Uh, thank oh, Sorry, uh, Julia, please. I was going to yeah. say if somebody could respond on that particularly, it would be great. And, and some of the earlier ones we can cover. Probably. Absolutely. And so I had raised my hand, but I just I just really wanted to point to the chat because Michael brings up so many relevant and important topics and acknowledging also um, several of the things that Kimberly said and that Jan said. I'm going to follow Jan's model of a couple of different using a couple of different buckets. Uh, first off, the most recent topic um, that you mentioned 
uh, Michael, yes, it is important. We know that macroalgae and seaweeds are really important in the nutrient cycling, carbon and nitrogen. However, we don't have a quantitative monitoring program <laughs> for getting those data. How, you know, being a field scientist now, seeing the macroalgae develop and, you know, combine and then, um, you know, land on beaches, it, we know it's an important question. Um, how to incorporate that, it's, we, it's a conversation that's worth having. However, to focus the work of this group, um, we are focusing on phytoplankton production, but it's to acknowledge that what you bring up is important too. So maybe future work, Stefano. <laughs> um, in any case, uh, going back to some of the things you talked about, the limiting factors, I think that those are very good questions for testing hypotheses, absolutely. We need to understand nutrient limitation. I know Jan's work that she mentioned with the primary production, she did nutrient limitation experiments. Has nutrient limitation changed also? You know, And that is gets at this really, really important question. And Stefano, I, I'm gonna let you bring up the question that you know is guiding some of this work about the euphotic zone. Mm -hmm. And, um, but also that jumps into the third place I wanted to um, acknowledge what Kim said about benthic algae, benthic diatoms, and also it relates to the shallow areas and the terminal inlets that are really important in some of the nutrient cycling. Um, when I was still at Ecology and we had the South Sound project that uh, informed the Salish Sea model for the South Sound, um, we started to get really interested in those terminal inlets and especially the ones that had, you know, they were shallow enough that the euphotic zone reached the bottom for most of the year. It's very interesting to think about the processes. And then when we, you know, the seasons shift and now we have all this wind and wave and mixing and transport and transfer of organic matter, that is really critical to understand and how that affects the food web. So hopefully models can start addressing those questions, but I think you've laid out some really, really good points. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to take the opportunity, as we have no hands up right now, <laughs> if you could uh, share those slides. Um, we're, so we, we do have a hard stop at 9.55, and we're trying to keep these as short as we can so that we're not taking up eight hours of people's day and just try to reconnect more regularly. And I hope this format's working. Um, for everybody, and there's a chance to go and watch the videos and and uh, send some information in on uh, on the other breakouts. Um, so the next slide, and I think we're opening a bit of a can of worms here, but this is really for next steps. <laughs> um, what we've done here is just put some of those hypotheses that we've been talking about here, and the intention is the next workshops, and, and this is going to have to be across both the PSAMP monitoring as well as the, the modelling, is to really dive a bit deeper on addressing the uncertainties um, in, the, in the changes observed that we're seeing. And, and some of it, um, I think what we've pulled up today is that uh, there's some critical parts from some of the other breakout groups that are, that are really important, and I'll, I'll point to um, Mike's comment on and, and Jan's on the shallow water systems. Um, that is a priority. The, the next stage of the model, and, and, and Sukyong could provide a little bit more information for the Salish Sea model, and Parker could also. It really requires a higher resolution in the shallow water. So it's, we have to recognize the limitations of the current, what we're calling the operational model that we're using um, for the state, and even the current version that's being used for research. It doesn't have the shallow water work. Um, so I think it's just a, a gut check here. Is this the right approach? Um, and then in particular, uh, what we're seeing is that there's a, there's a real opportunity, um, there's a real opportunity to uh, look at some of the physical processes first across some of these hypotheses. I think Jan and others were alluding to it. There's a lot of different, um, a lot of the basis of a lot of these questions have modeling and monitoring components that can be addressed. And so we were looking to prioritize the parts of the physical system um, that would then make the availability of nutrients to the euphotic zone as a low hanging fruit, as a starting point, because if we, we can get to the physics of it now, we can't do it in the shallow waters 
but we can now with our current systems and we can start to get um, at, at these hypotheses. So would anybody want to comment on that? And can we move to the next slide where I've put some of those examples? I think it's the next one, let's just check. I know, okay, that's fine. You can go back. Just to leave it, the one before, that's fine. We'll just leave it on that question. Thank you. And I'm, Mike's put in the chat, just raise your hand as well. But um, Mike, I can comment on that. The, the version that is current for the Salish Sea model does include seagrass and macroalgae, and there's a new grant working with Caitlin to advance some of that. Um, and others can speak for, for some of the other modeling. The, 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 rec the recognition we have to have is if we're talking about what we're using um, for the state, that's, a, that's what we're calling an operational version, if you like, and that's different to, to the most current version. Um, and I think, uh, Jan, were you, I think you were first. Yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of focusing on, well, we don't have any models that address the shallow water systems, but we have a lot of data from shallow mm -hmm. water systems and um, from various groups, be they King County, DNR has a anemone program that's really focused on nearshore, and I know there's others, and, and I just think... We, I don't want to see us like, oh, well, we work to make this better model, and then we compare the model to the data. I think there's a first step for these areas where we don't have the model um, well um, addressed is to exploit what we can from the data to, to look at some of the answers to these questions. Excellent. And I think this shows the importance of the PSAMP group's role um, already in this and then the opportunity for us to leverage it and try to get some of those low hanging fruits to, to, to test out actually, you know, how, how good our parameters are and our inputs. Um, I, think, I think, Julia, you were next. Um, I'm gonna to defer to Ron Tom, cause I wanna circle back to a couple other uh, topics. So go ahead, okay. Ron. Okay, yeah, thank you. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in what, um, Martha presented or talked about about the watersheds and the, as sources of nutrients and um, from the standpoint of we can potentially do something about that I don't see that in this list of hypotheses other than nutrient balance is is that you know I know I, and I'm I, you know I don't know what what sources of nutrients are but I know the ocean's a big one um, perhaps over 90 percent I guess and more but what are the we can't do a whole lot about that i guess and we can do maybe more uh, in watersheds and other types of restoration um so i it's kind of a question or a comment i guess is that is that a reasonable um absolutely absolutely i think i can have a first stab at that i think the these were pulled from uh the earlier discussions in PSAM, but largely from as as um uh, Julia had said from Christopher Krem's group, and and it, it is prioritizing what the human contribution is in that. It's the fact that there's the modulation of it, exactly as you're saying. You know, what what is the ocean impact? What's the interannual variability? Um, but but ultimately, what's the the human contribution to the euphotic zone, and how does it differ between basins? Great, thank you. Um. Have we got any other questions or comments? Oh, Julia, you were you had your hand up before, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. And so I think with just a few minutes left, I think it's a good also um, topic to bring up because somebody uh, referred to this about, I think, top-down versus bottom-up control. And this got me thinking also, because I was, as I was putting together this um, teaser, I was thinking about that also, and it was getting a little complicated, but then I was um, inspired to go look at recent work and I found um, a great paper. And so this gets me to the topic of state of knowledge. And if this group wants to start also sharing resources for current state of knowledge, there is a, a recent paper out actually a few weeks ago where a team of modelers used, they incorporated both bottom up and top down control in the same model because they recognize that different parts of the food web 
could be responding to either or both of those. And when they incorporated those types of controls into their modeling scenarios, they were much, um, the, the model improved in replicating um, the, uh, the data and the observations in the biological realm. And it's so exciting because I think it's not a question of um, either or, it's just like when, you know, when are either of these and what conditions lead to when part of the food web is controlled by the bottom up resources or by predators, right? That's what we're talking about. And there's both. And so that's exciting. And so I would love to share that paper. The other paper I'd like to share with people is, um, and I don't see any of our Canadian colleagues, Susan Allen's group in this breakout room, but maybe I'm missing some people. I don't know everyone. Um, you know, they've been working on modeling um, Georgia Strait and the Canadian part of the Salish Sea. And they have some work that looks at production in the Strait of Georgia. Specifically in 2018, there was a conference presentation at the Salish Sea Ecosystem Conference that talks about river influence systems. And if stratification is changing, is you know, they think they see production is lower in river influenced systems that have higher stratification because of a fluctuating halo cline. So it's another thing for this group to follow. Um, but the big topic for both of those pieces of information is do we want to start to assemble some resources for shared knowledge in this team for future discussions? I leverage that to Stefano to talk about. <laughs> Great. Um, well, I think the answer is yes. If anybody wants to send them in, we can we can facilitate. Um, and I'll just make a distinction. We there is the the state of knowledge that's being done for the marine water quality, and that's just as at its final stages of review. Um, and it has a section um, that I had asked some of you folks to, to help with, but it, it's going out for a wider review and that would be a great starting point. And Jeff Rice, who's the communications lead on PSI, is has got uh, resources and support to, to try to get some of a synthesis of some of this out to a wider audience too. And, and I would consider an update to the um, encyclopedia coming out of that. And so I would hope that um, you're going to put your hands up for a review and input. That would be fantastic. And, and that could be something that we can do in, in parallel. And that's across, obviously, monitoring and modeling. It's, it, it could be supportive of both groups. So um, I think we're meant to have a hard stop now. And I just want to say thank you for this great participation and let's get into the details going forward. I'd like to see you all at the next meeting and I'll see you in the main room. I'm not actually sure how to do that. I think we just push leave somewhere. There it is, leave rooms. Bye then.